Welcome to Believe in 76ers with your host, former 76ers point guard Eric Snow and two Sixers fanatics in Marcus and Tasia Dash. Believe in 76ers is presented by BetOnline.ag. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports, contests, and events with first-to-market odds and lines. Find reviews and news for every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports information from live in game betting, props, and futures. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to join today and make your first sports bet. Use our promo code BELIEVE50. That's B L E A V 5 0 to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, where the game starts. Hey guys, welcome to Believe in 76ers podcast. I'm Marcus Dash, here with our host, former 76ers point guard, Eric Snow, and my brother, Tasia Dash. Last week, uh, we had to come back on, as we, as we mentioned, with the breaking news, the Montrose Herald signing. Um, as as you per usual, uh, the Sixers fans, it's a mix, mixed bag on it. We're going to we're gonna get into uh, the mixed bag on uh, the Montrose Herald signing in today's episode. Um, so we're just going to go right into it. Um a lot of chatter about the reason Doc was fired from the Clippers was his refusal to play Zubach over Harrell, um, especially in the playoffs. Uh, and now a lot of people are saying this is going to happen again, that same kind of, you know, refusing to play, you know, uh, Reed or Bassey for Harrell is going to come over to to um, Philadelphia now with Doc. Um, is this something we should be uh, actually worried about, as some Sixers fans really are, even before the season starts? Um, or should Harrell have a short lease in order to keep developing uh, Paul Reed and Charles Bassey? Um, well, I, I mean, I feel this. I mean, I think the the main reason that um, fans or people will get on Doc is if the team doesn't win. That that's what to me is going to come down to. So I think you you, you do what helps the team win. Um, I don't think that he'll be locked into any big um, outside of Joel. That's I think that that's what it'll come down to. He'll be locked into him and overextend his minutes and monitor his minutes, whatever's needed in order for him to be most successful. Um, I think Harold get the, you know, first bunch of minutes, but I think he'll still have to produce to maintain that. I do not see a, a situation where if he's not producing the way that I'm sure that he wants to and the team wants him to, um, I don't think there will be any hesitation in making the change. So I don't, I don't see a, a lingering issue here because I think the, um, you know, the expectations on this team was already here before he arrived. Yeah, Tejo, what, uh, what camp do you fall into on this one? Are you uh, one of these uh, these anti-Herald signing uh, guys? No, definitely not anti-Herald. Um, it's funny, too, because when we were talking so long about well, – we brought up Cousins, we brought up um, – who did we bring up? Uh, Whiteside over the past couple of months. We kind of just forgot about Harold because of the charges, but like he, if he was just there – you know, everyone's everyone's fans would be saying, "Why aren't you signing him? Why aren't you signing him?" So you know, um, it worked out. Uh, I'm, I agree. I, best player plays, man. I, this isn't the process Sixers anymore. We need to stop getting so attached to these young guys that we treat like our children at a, at a, at a little baseball game. Like Reed and Bassey need to prove they deserve minutes, and they we can't just give them precious time on the floor because we want to see our guy develop. Like. Harold's a superior player. I don't think anyone can argue that, right? Uh, and I'll tell you what, too. I thought of this recently. Harden just played with Bassey in those pickup games we talked about, like, I don't know, three, three, four weeks ago. Two weeks later, he's campaigning and recruiting Harold. I think he got a good look at Bassey, and I think he saw kid can play, but we're, good, we're championship running right now. We're not developing for the future. Let's get Harold. Like, Bassey can, yeah, he's, he's all right, but, like, we need to do – this is now. Are my windows now? Our windows now? Joel, Harden, same – pretty much same timeline more or less. Um, you know, if, if MB can, you know, break through some of these injury problems, he can play longer, obviously. But they're pretty close in windows at this point. Um, I trust Harden's eyes on the court. I trust that he thinks Bassie's not there yet. And I know I'm not – I'm not having to talk about Reed, but I'm not going to lose sleep in September – 
about playoff minutes. Let's get there first. I'm not going to cry about who's going to play more right now. If that's a problem then, and it's obvious that Harrell is a problem and he needs less minutes, then we can cry and complain about it. We'll cry and complain about it right on the show, actually. Uh, but to worry about it now is foolish, especially when we know MB will probably miss 10 to 15 games and what's Harrell going to average starting in that position, uh, 15 and 10. I'm not going to complain about that either. So I think it's totally fine. I'm a huge fan of the signing, and I'm not going to worry about the playoffs yet. Eric, do you feel the same way where, like, you know, if the fact that Harden was campaigning to sign Harold, do you think, and we talked about him working out with Bassey this, this offseason, do you think maybe he just he saw something with Bassey? He's like, okay, maybe he's not ready to be the, the full-on backup five. No, I don't, I don't think he saw something with Bassey that made him, you know, want Harold to come aboard. I think he wanted Harold to come aboard because he felt like he was a solid player that could help the team. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's just, just that. And – um, I think that along with, you know, the organization that felt that way, that's why, you know, he was signed. Yeah. Um, you know, and, I, and you did it and, you know, I guess, you know, some of the charges that he had probably hurt his, his, his pay, but um, I, 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 I would assume, and I'm sure Tasty knows the numbers um, better than I do, but I could, I would assume that he would have got paid more if he was without the charges. Um, so if you get a guy that's, you know, probably, you know, not probably, but his talents above his pay rate. You know, that's 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 definitely a plus. Amazing uh, experience with the coach. Um, you know, you know, current players are plugging for him. I think it helps. And so, you know, hopefully, it it it, it helps into you know translating more wins um, and more effectiveness for us. But it was definitely worth you know the risk, if people want to call it a risk. Uh, I think it was definitely worth it. I think, it's, I think it's very low risk for the money. I think it's great. I mean, he fall, totally falls into the whole Dwight Howard Drummond area for me. Younger, even mm-hmm. younger. Yeah. Well, and plus, it's like you know, we talk about oh, we 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 need more dogs out there. We got PJ Tucker. We end up getting him. That's another that's another dog, and I can't wait to see those two in a lineup together. But um, if people talk about Doc, you know, and with, with with having this kind of like you know this love for uh, Harold in L.A. I mean, it seems that Harden was the one pushing for him. It wasn't even Doc, you know? So it's like Harden was the one who wanted him, you know, a different person who wanted him over here, you know? And obviously Doc probably signed off on it and all. But mm-hmm. um, the, the one thing I did, someone who was, you know, siding with the, the signing of Trez on online, he said it's like, you know, with the LA team, it was, kind of, it was a different scenario because Harold was the starting five on that team when they were looking for rotational backup five minutes Harold's going to be getting that those backup five minutes. I mean, he's not, especially in the playoffs where those guys don't really play that much. Maybe spot, maybe spots here and there, but like it's mostly going to be in beaten in the game. So I think people are getting caught up in the backup five minutes in the playoffs. Is that it's silly? Yeah, I mean, I think you know you want the the guys that you feel can help you win games, win championships. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I think the team has become better with his signing. Yeah, how he's used. I mean, I think people are just, you know, probably getting a little ahead of themselves okay. by kind of trying to figure out how he's going to be used. Mm-hmm. Like we we don't know that. The one thing we do know is he has a runner up MVP in front of him. Yeah. So it's not going to be too many minutes, um, as long as Joel is healthy, that it's sort of a concern. So so if it was a concern that Doc played him or wouldn't play another guy. If Joel is healthy, that concern kind of goes away because of who he is. So it's if you're telling me that Montrezl Harrell can come in and play 10 to 15 minutes that Joel doesn't play, I'm feeling good about my team in, in, in that position. Yeah, I'll even take it a step further. Let's go – if you're deciding if we should sign him, Harrell that is, let's say you're Doc and, and you're Maury in your room together, and you're like, hmm – if we had a Harrell against the Miami when MB got knocked out, how much better would we have felt going into game one with Harrell starting at five against Bam instead of Reed? I mean, I would have felt way more confident, at least that we can maybe split, maybe split. We were still under Amanda, obviously. We we're missing our MVP. But if Harrell was there, I wouldn't have felt as bad. I felt like the series was over when MB was out. I thought it was done. Harrell would have been a big difference. So – if you can sit there and say, man, I wish we had him three months ago, why would you not want him? So that I mean, that, that for me sealed it. 
Yeah. That's like you said, you know, a lot of these Sixer fans have been tied to the, the younger guys, like our guys kind of thing. And yeah, yeah. It, it, I think it is a product of the, the process and, you know, kind of really, it really is guys. It's yeah. tough to shake that off when you're, when you're rooting for the, you know, for the, 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 the Hollis Thompson's, the Cajun McDaniels of the world. And you, and you, and you're, you're looking for them to succeed over your own team doing well. It's like, okay, like, are you a fan of the guy or are you a fan of your team? Cause I mean, you want the best guy to play, especially if it's going to be 12 to 14 minutes a game, you know? Yeah. yeah. Loyal fans, man. Loyal. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so uh, with, the, with the, the next topic, um, so with the recent news of Danilo Gallinari, um, uh, injury news, he's going to be out for, I think, pretty much the entire season, if not. If not oh, if yeah. Not. Um, and so with that, and that was a big thing for uh, Boston, kind of adding to their depth with having Gallinari. Huge. Um, and so you, you couple that with Danilo Gallinari out for most of the season with Boston, and, and then our signing of Montrez Harrell. Question remains now because everyone's talking about us being the one of the deepest teams in the East, if not in the entire NBA. So my question to you guys, do you feel that the Philadelphia 76ers are the deepest team in the Eastern Conference? And I'll take it a step further in the NBA. You want me, let, let me go first, Eric, because I, I <laughs> go ahead. I did some background here on some of the my my favorite deep teams. So I'll go ahead and name you some of them right now and, and to make it easier on us. Um, Clippers, personally, I think the best one. Their their backups are Jackson, Powell, Morris, Covington, Terrence Mann, and Kennard. I don't think anyone's gonna beat that. Like that, that's a that that's like a that starting five might not even be last the NBA, okay? If they play if they played. So uh Celtics, Brogdon, White, and Williams, Nets. Curry, O'Neal, and Warren, also very good. Um, Cavs, Lavert, Love, and Osman, pretty good as well. Uh, Mavs have a good bench. Uh, Hardaway, Wood, Kleba, and Bertans. Um, this is depth chart listing, by the way. How if they go throughout the season, Wood starts some games. I'm just I'm I'm just naming who they have on the bench. Warriors, obviously. Pool, Kaminga, DiVincenzo, Jamichael Green, um, us, Melton, House, Matisse, Harrell, Heat, Oladipo, Hero, and Vincent, and then Bucks, Hill, Connaughton, and more uh, and Morris, uh, Portis. Um, so those I just marked down as the better ones, but now, now I'm sorry, make it a little easier for you to to decide. Um. Yeah, I think I, I I couldn't. I would say the Clippers are probably the deepest. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think it's you know it's arguably for good enough for us to <clears throat> be in the East. I think you can say that. Um, I think that outside of really having Joel and James, our depth is kind of what kind of pushes people to kind of include us. For the most part, you know, to possibly win the division um, with the new additions, and and you add in players that um, have played crucial positions and crucial minutes on on winning teams. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I I wouldn't necessarily say um, anyone is deeper. Now, if you want to debate top fives, <laughs> that's you know that's that could be different, um, but you know it's, and I think um, what is it the Bucks? I think the Bucks bench is probably better than people give credit for. I do think so. Um, they just have so much, um, and and it not I'm just from um, not just from a um, is really. Going into this year, didn't they sign who they who who they didn't they sign the guy that was with Utah and went to Portland? You know what? He wasn't listed on there on their depth yes. chart. You're right, Ingles. Yes. So, assuming that he comes back close to the form that he was in, um, and then I, I think the one thing with the Bucks is their bench fits. Yes, fits their style. It fits their best player. It's it's, a, it's sort of like they the easier for them to plug and play. Um, so if I had to pick someone, I wouldn't pick Boston's bench over our 
course. I wouldn't pick the Nets, even though I really like the Nets. Um, Miami has a deep team because they play so many young guys and so many yeah. guys. That, so I would I would say Miami probably has the all around deepest team because they can play so many different guys and so mm-hmm. many different guys off the bench. You really look at the guys that came off the bench for them. A lot of those guys ended games. Um, I think that hurts. Not having PJ, not really replacing him, um, hurts. Um, so I, I would say if if someone probably outside of us, I would say the Bucks because of in in talent and feel and fit for complementing your best player and your style of play that you choose to play. Mm-hmm. And you know, having a guy like Porter's that can play with Lopez and behind him. Mm-hmm. Like we've been looking for a guy like Porter's that we talk about forever. I know. Well, we've been doing this podcast. We've been talking about a guy like we use him as examples of a guy like Porter's. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that tells you um that, you know, with him, and you know, I just think of Ingles and some of the other guys that are there. That would probably be the team, those them in Miami, depending on how Miami shakes out, that I would say is up there as far as death. Um, with, you know, you know, arguably Cleveland and Boston and, and uh, in Brooklyn not too far behind. If Harold developed a three, he could be our portis. <laughs> Easier said than done, right? Yeah, yeah. Just exactly. developing a thirty-eight percent three-point shot, you know. Exactly. The team still can't do it. Um, <laughs> uh, I'd say, yeah. The thing is, we have a top-heavy roster, so to have a deep bench on top of having a top-heavy starting five, it's it's a great combination to have. I, I think we're we're lucky to add the pieces we did with little to no money. You know what we came out with was amazing. Um, you know, you don't have to have the deepest bench in the league, but you have decent bench if your your team's top heavy, which we are. Um, so we basically took our team from last year and just added really the missing pieces, man. We we really did add exactly what we said we needed to go into this whole team uh, this offseason. It, it was it was dogs, more rebounding, uh, toughness, and you know, corner th- it's more consistent corner threes. I think we added that. Yeah. So uh, to piggyback off that question um, and with the Donovan Mitchell trade happening uh, two weeks ago, um, with us being one of the deepest and top heavy teams in the uh, East, how would you guys rank the top six teams in the East going into the season? Ouch. Go right on in then, um, Marcus. I'm a firm believer. Is East or NBA? You said East, East, right? right? Okay. You said East. I'm a firm believer that Going into the season, and this kind of um, lightens my expectations for, for the Sixers. I believe you got to put the two teams that ended the conference um, up top. Um, they they earned them their ways to the conference finals, and they were the two top teams in the um, to finish in the regular season. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I would say. I will put Boston first and Miami second. Um, since Milwaukee's won the championship more recently, I'll put them third and us fourth. Um, and, and and that makes our path a little tougher, mm-hmm. but <laughs> because if not, who you yeah, three put yeah. there? You wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Who I think you're going to put there? <laughs> yeah, five. Um, I'm going to put <laughs> Cleveland at five. We're going to put Cleveland at five. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cleveland at five. I'm going to put Brooklyn at six. Yeah, yeah. Nice way to avoid that. So, they can avoid, um, so we can avoid um, them or Milwaukee in uh, conference final in, into the conference finals. Okay. Um, and then you know that's that's that'll be my six. Wow. <laughs> The East is kind of stacked because then that means that means oh, Toronto, man. that means Toronto's gonna be like a seven or eight seed, and then I don't know who would be the who would be the eight seed in the, in the Atlanta, Atlanta. I'd say, yeah. Dang. I mean, we can't say let's pick six and not pick six. I mean, there's only six. You only got six choices. No, it's true. No, I was I was just when you said <laughs> we said was six, I was like, huh, man. That means Toronto's on the outside looking in, and they're you know there'd be a seven seed. Yeah, somebody's gonna be somebody's gonna be over there. Whew. It's a tough. 
It's a tough man. East is East is beast again, dude. Even though West won the finals, it's, I think I think the East is. I mean, they're both going to be really tough conferences, but I think the East is finally back to where it was a long time ago. So it's just cool. Um, what, 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 what's your uh, What's your top six? So I, I I did a little bit of what what Eric was saying. I, I took the Eastern re- representative. They got better this off season too. So it's not like they just stayed the same and whatever. They got Brogdon. No, Gallinari's gone. They'll probably sign someone else like. Uh, Carmelo to offset the Gallinari loss. Um, so I got I got Boston number one. I have us two. Uh, I think we're top heavy and have depth, best pick and roll duo in the league. A full off season with Harden to be in the best shape of his career, develop chemistry. We have a great mix of shooting and dogs. It might be one of the most well balanced rosters we've had in a very very long time. Actually, um, I took Bucks three. I just think with our continuity. They were just champions, what, two years ago? So it's, it wasn't that long ago. They had a lot of injuries last year. Um, so if they are healthy, they're the top three in the East. And I think they're going to manage minutes a little more this season, not be as worried about their record. And they're going to try to just keep Middleton and Middleton and uh, Giannis as healthy as possible. Um, four, I went Nets. Uh, man, their roster so talented. They just have so many question marks. I mean, Warren hasn't played in years. Simmons hasn't played in over a year. Harris hasn't played in basically a year. Their two players don't want to be there anymore, and they don't like their coaching and management. Even if you have a lot of talent, that's a lot of obstacles to get over. That's a lot of things. So, yeah, they have the talent of a top team, but that's a lot of red flags. So I'm going to put them at four. Um, Cavs I have at five. I think they're just an ascending team, and they can just take another step in their development. Um, they have a great balance too with scoring and defense. Now, uh, they can just grow up and gel. They're scary, man. They're really, really are scary. Um, and then six, it came down to Atlanta or Miami for me. I went Miami in the end. Um, although I, I, I think Miami's also going to suffer in standings. I think they're definitely going to prioritize staying healthy for the playoffs. Um, Seeing Lowry with just zero juice left in the playoffs. They don't want that to happen again. And they can't rely on Butler to go 40, 40 plus minutes every night and, and, and carry the offense again. It's just not going to work. So I think they're going to try to manage minutes this year and keep their guys, their their veterans healthy. Um, and then, yeah, seven and eight between yeah Atlanta and Toronto to figure it out. <laughs> yep. I mean, if you, I mean, that's if, you, if we come just on paper. I mean, they should be number one. Yeah, on paper, it's on, yeah. It's on, on paper. Absolutely. I took it out of four because of all the stuff they have going on, man. I just – I'm, I'm – I put them in six because I I just – I don't know when guys are going to play. Yeah. But we don't know. Like, I haven't seen Ben Simmons play basketball. If they had a hard knocks in the NBA, dude, I would pay money to see I, I haven't seen – I haven't seen Ben Simmons play. Yeah, I've, I've seen, seen Kyrie I seen play, Warren play. I've seen Kyrie play, but do we want to still be there? Like, do KD no. truly want to be there? Like, no. So if if they're professional professional enough to get by it, I don't know if you know the locker room will develop the way it needs to be to get there. And it may very well get there at the end of the year, but I do think there is going to be bumps especially early in the season through the season. That's why I didn't really have them as high as the talent says. Can they get through those hard times with having as many problems as they do? That's we'll, the we'll, we'll, we'll find out. I mean, it, it, it comes down to the leadership um, in that locker room. If, if they can, you know, all come together and that leadership can help and they can buy in and put forth that effort and do it collectively, without a doubt they can do it. They can do it, but – um, it's going to take a lot. It's going to take a lot of um, commitment and sacrifice from uh, multiple guys um, in order for that to happen. Who do you think the li- – side question, going off this, who was the leader on the OKC team back in the day with Westbrook and Harden and uh, Duran? Who do you think the leader of the team was? Was it Harden um, or uh, Duran or Westbrook? Out of those three? Yeah, I think it comes down to probably Westbrook or Durant. Was, I, I one of those. Well, two. I mean, I think I would say Russell. Um, you know, Russ is, you know, Russ has a sort of his 
facial expressions kind of puts off a different vibe from people that are watching from the outside. Um, but if you look at his work ethic, we know he play hard. We know he work hard. And you look at his lifestyle off the court. Um, yeah, he's basketball number one. And, and he's family number one. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, you haven't heard anything about him and his lifestyle. So you kind of see a guy like that. It's easier to command the locker room when you have that. Yeah. Um, so I don't know for certain, but I'm just saying it's easier to command a locker room if sure. you do that. Um, on the other hand, you can be as talented as you want, but if guys see you kicking it and, and or the guys see you not working hard, the last thing they're going to do is listen to you <laughs> try to tell them what to do, no matter how good you are. Um, but I don't know how particular those, – all those guys were so young. I think the veterans on their team kind of – they kind of did it collectively. Mm -hmm. um, now, I was just thinking back to all of Durant's teams because he wasn't the leader on Golden State on that team. So, like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he wasn't the leader, but he wasn't really a follower either. No, he was probably the you know I mean, what I'm saying? arguably so, the best uh, player at that yeah. part. Yeah, at that, that point, they were, and that was sort of the opposite of what we're talking about now because that team was so individually driven and individually talented, individually professional. What I need to do that it's not really who's leading the team as much as it is they're able to hold each other accountable to do their jobs because there's so many guys you have you've knocked out a lot of the mess. Golden State was already a well-oiled machine. They just added on like a badass extension to it with Durant, pretty much. Whereas yeah, Brooklyn, but Brooklyn, if you have but if you had issues, that machine can still be messed up. So obviously, definitely the, the machine was going well, and the and the extra part that came in was doing well too. <laughs> mm -hmm. But with Brooklyn, it's different because he is a part of the core base of what's being built there. Where he wasn't a part of the base that was built in Golden State, he was an extension being added on to it, which can yeah, ruin I mean, the entire it's, thing. It's, I mean, I, I I I firmly believe with with KD there, the way he was playing before he got injured this year was. Arguably one of the best starts he had in a while, um, but I, I think it's it was that team is different from the standpoint of you had you really had a team that was really built around two guys, and then kind of other guys built around them. So I just didn't think they complemented each other a lot. Where this team they have now is deeper and more complementary pieces. Um, they just don't have the time together that, you know, Golden State and all those other teams have been through through sure. the playoffs and been yeah. through the ringer and tough and highs and lows and have spent all that time together that, where they can build that cohesive network where this team hasn't done that. So will it take time or were they talent or, or will their talent help them prevail situations that come up? Well, it's also a little scary, too, because you, you don't very often see the leader of your team completely not trust coaching or management. So usually, usually the leader is an extension of your coach or the coach on the court. But in this case, there's a blatant disconnect between your best player leader and the coach. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that, that's very true. Um I think at the end of the day, if if that guy or those guys come back and they're there, it, it comes down to, like I said before, how professional everybody are going to be moving forward. If if they, they guys can come in and say, hey, this is where we're at and this is how I feel, and then that his actions meets his words, you can get by that. Um but the actions are going to have to meet the words that are said. Um, and there'll be more, you know, eyes on it because of everything that happened. Yeah. So, but if it's, if it's done, you can correct it, but guys are going to pay attention. You're going to pay attention to oh, how you behave and what you say and what you do. And, and not only towards the players, but also towards how the coaches coach. Absolutely. Yeah. So you've just, kind of put more eyes on that situation that 
that's why I say everything they have an opportunity if it goes smoothly. It's just a lot of a lot of mess, a lot of stuff going on. But if they can get it going, the talent's there. Because they can undermine everything. If Durant's yeah. dogging Nash on the sides, and then Nash wants to go ahead and coach that's, more, that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. So it's more like, more like what all of that stuff is it's gonna matter. How how they come together and if those because they're gonna say all the right stuff when it starts. Mm -hmm. um, but the actions got to match those words. For instance, like AI and Brown had run-ins, right? And they yeah. disagreed on a lot. But when it came down to it, AI was laying it down for Brown on the court. But there was no question of the day, his dedication level to Brown and what Brown was trying to do there, right? But Well, their, their disagreements were their disagreements. But the one thing that they didn't disagree on was that Coach Brown knew Allen was going to play hard. Yep. And AI knew Coach Brown was going to coach hard. Yep. That, that would, if you ever talk about, see about anything that they ever talked about, that was never in question. No, yeah, it was mutual. Um, and it was never in question from teammates. So the issues that they had was almost like personal that didn't, uh, be honest with you, didn't impact the team whatsoever. Because when it came down to it, the, the basketball part was mutual. And that well, wasn't that. The, the basketball part was almost the escape. Yeah, yeah. Whereas <laughs> you know that's, not, that's not the case yeah. here. Yeah. Like that's a major part of the problem. So it's like I don't think it is a personal thing with Durant and Nash. I think they would have fine having a cup of coffee together. I think it is the basketball part that they don't agree on mostly. So it's 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 it's, it's a weird situation to have. It's not a personal. It's interesting. Thing. Let's see how they play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's man. Moral of the story, Brooklyn Nets, giant question mark going into this. So, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that tag, you got to tag a lot of Brooklyn fans. That's, in this that's, how, that's how they get to um, be number six on my list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> way to tie it all number, in there. Instead like, of number one. <laughs> way, way, way to wrap it all in together. Yep. Yep. <laughs> all right, fellas. Well, that does it for us. Thanks for tuning in to Believe in 76ers presented by Bet Online. We'll see you guys next week as we continue to talk as we head into training camp in two weeks. So, see you All guys right. in a week. Coming. Take it easy. Later, guys. Guys.